Welcome to the Media Library of First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas. We hope and pray you receive a blessing from today's message. First Baptist Church of Troy is a Christ-centered, family-friendly church which offers activities for kids, teens, and adults. You can learn more and contact us by visiting fbctroytx.org. Now, here's today's message. We're going to start a new series uh, leading up through Christmas, uh, looking at Christmas changes everything. Christmas changes everything everything. Uh, and I've got to give, you know, uh, Gail did a beautiful job here on our decorations, and I've got to give a shout out to uh, Carrie, our ministry assistant, who put together all of this. She, I don't know how she did it, but she took a lot of different things, and she puts it all together for our slides, and so when you see her, tell her thank you for doing that. And so, if you will, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 7. And you may say, well, wait a minute, this isn't a Christmas passage. Yes, it is. This is a Christmas passage. So Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. Verses 4 through 7 of Galatians chapter 4. If I find it here, my, bi- my bifocals just shifted on me. There we go. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son than an heir through God. Christmas changes everything. You know what, folks, and most of you that have kids, you know this, the birth of a baby changes everything, right? Uh, I read about this young couple who uh, uh, had just had a child, newborn child, child only been home a couple of days, and it's about 3 a.m., and, and the mother just takes and shakes her husband awake and says, hey, I need you to go check the baby real quick. And the husband, you know, he sets up startled. He sets up ready to go, and he stops, and he listens. He says, but I don't hear anything. And the mama said, I know, it's your turn to see why not. You know, you'll get it later. (laughs) Chris, having a baby changes everything. It changes a lot of things. It changes your sleeping habits. All of a sudden, you're, uh, you're awake at night and want to sleep at the job during the day, right? It, it, uh, your life gets noisier, right? Grocery shopping's different because you discover how many different kinds of formula and foods are actually out there. And then, oh my, let's not talk child-proofing your home. Right? Child-proofing your home, you find that it also almost makes it adult-proof when you try to get in the cabinet. Right? You try to get that, you can't get in those things. Babies change everything. It brings big changes in your life. Christmas is a celebration of the birth of a baby who changed everything. He changed everything. He not only made a big difference in his own home, but he also made a big difference in the world. Look around. Look at everybody here. You're all here because of that. You're all here. The reason you're here and not out there is because a baby being born on Christmas. His birth is meant to change everything for you. Not only does his birth change things for the world, but his his birth is to change everything for us also. And so this morning, I want to talk about how the birth of Jesus Christ changes life. How it can change life. And I want us to look at three changes that Christmas brings. The first change is this. The birth of Jesus changed history. It changed history. Paul says uh, here in verse 4, when the time came to completion, some of your versions say in the fullness of time, 
The world we live in, think about this, the world we live in is shaped by the past, right? You and I live in America because of an explorer named Christopher Columbus who discovered the new world and opened the door for European settlers to make their home here. That's why we live here. We don't speak French or Spanish because the British who spoke English colonized most of North America. You live in a democracy because we have forefathers who fought and died and soldiers since then who have fought and died to preserve our freedom. The world today is shaped by the events of the past. But no event has changed the world as much as the birth of Jesus Christ. That little baby born in Bethlehem. I mean, think about the changes that his birth has produced. Probably the most obvious change you'll see is, I don't know if any of y'all ever write checks anymore. Out of curiosity's sake, I just want to, how many of y'all still write checks? Okay. Yeah, our non-check writers have it now. Everybody's pays on, online and that. But if you ever write a check, or if you ever, like me, I go to HEB and I pull the milk out and I look at the expiration date. I always want to make sure on that. I'm going, okay, this is 2023. Yep, I've still got it. This milk's still good. We got it here. If you look at it, we want to know what year it is, right? We want to know what year it is. Well, where does that number for the year come from? It comes from the birth of Jesus. We use BC, which stands for before Christ, and we use the word A.D., uh, or we use A.D., which is Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. That divides, that's our outline of history. We know anything B.C. was back here, anything A.D., we're living in it right now. Now, they're actually trying to change that. <laughs> you know, they're trying to take Jesus out of this, and they're now calling it B.C.E., which means before common era, uh, era, or A.C.E., which means after common era. But even though they say that, they're still using the birth of Jesus to be the change point, and so they're acknowledging Jesus whether they're saying it or not. He's the change point in history. One thing that nobody can deny is this. In all of human history, it's divided by Jesus' entrance into the world. How would the world have been different if he had not been born at the right time, in the fullness of time? Think about this. Just remove every reference of Christ and his influence from the world's greatest literature, and the libraries wouldn't have as many books. Take away his influence from every great painting of him or that was inspired by him. And you have much less art to appreciate. If you close down all the great colleges that originally were founded to teach preachers of the gospel, did you know these, these colleges were were founded to proclaim the gospel, to train ministers to proclaim the gospel, you would have to shut down Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Georgetown. You would eliminate some of the greatest seats of learning if you did that. I, I wish they still <laughs> train preachers instead of becoming what they've become. Folks, Christianity with all of its failures, Christianity with all of its faults has been one of the most powerful forces of history. If Christ had never been born, human history would have been a very different story. But Christ was born. He was born at just the right time, right on schedule, according to the plan, mapped out uh, long before creation. God sent His Son to be born into this world. Jesus was born. He changed. His birth changed human history. But here's something that Jesus wants to do, folks. He wants more than anything to change your history. 
He wants to change your history. He wants to draw a line separating B.C. from A.D. in your life. He wants to transform everything about your history. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Jesus' birth changed history, but Jesus' entrance into your life will change your history as well. When Jesus enters your life, he changes the direction that you're going. A Christian is a person who's no longer chasing after sin, but he is now pursuing righteousness. Jesus changes our desires. The things we used to love to do, the things we used to love, we don't love them anymore. Yeah, we may still struggle with sinful desires, but our ultimate desire is to live worthy for our Lord. Jesus also changes your destiny. When Christ enters your life, He doesn't erase the past, but He changes how you relate to the past. He changes how you live in your present and He changes your hopes and your goals for the future. That's how Christ can change your history. And He wants to. So the question is, have you experienced that change? Do you know that change? If not, you're missing out on the most important change anyone can ever experience. The birth of Jesus truly is a turning point in human history. And again, he wants to be a turning point in your history as well. The second thing, change that we see in the birth of Christ is this. The birth of Jesus can change your relationship with God. Can change your relationship with God. In that last part of uh, verse 4 and, and then in verse 5 it says... Uh, uh, God sent his son, born to a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. I want you to think about this. Don't answer out loud, but I want you in your mind to think and answer this question. How would you describe your relationship with God? Now think about that. How would you describe your relationship with God? Probably the majority of people in this place and watching us online would have said, well, everything's okay between God and me. Is it really? Is it really? When Jesus begins his preaching, he calls everybody to make a change. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Change your mind. Change your life. That's what repent means. It means to make a change in what you're doing. To change from where you're going to turn around and go the other way. To change. Both Jesus and the Apostle Paul preach that everyone needs an important change in their relationship with God. Paul uses two words, in fact, to explain the change that Jesus was born to bring. The first word that we find in our verses that we just read is the word redemption. That word redemption basically has, uh, involves two ideas, to purchase and to liberate. To purchase and to liberate. And Paul's idea of redemption comes from the slave market that he was familiar with there in the ancient world. And People back then became slaves in those days for a variety of reasons, but, but there was basically only two ways a slave could find their freedom. Either their master freed them, or someone else would redeem them. In other words, they would pay the price for him to be set free. Whatever he would go, he would go to, to that slave's master and say, I want this slave, I want you to set this slave free. No, I'm not going to say him slave. Well, what's it worth to you to, for me to buy him, to set him free? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll sell him to you for X, Y, Z. And okay, here it is, X, Y, Z. And he paid for that slave's freedom to now know freedom. Now, you might be saying here, well, I'm really not a slave. Nobody's my master. But Jesus says something else. Jesus says this. I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. 
Now in the Greek, do you know what that word everyone means? Everyone. Everyone. There's not a person here excluded. Not even me. Everyone. I mean, have you ever committed a sin? Don't raise your hand. Have you ever done wrong knowing that you were doing wrong? Yeah, we that time we do wrong not knowing, but it, how many times do we do wrong knowing we're doing wrong, right? Jesus says you're a slave. You're a slave to sin. And you're a slave then to sin's destiny. For the wages of sin is what? We'll try that again. Make sure you're awake. For the wages of sin is? Death. Death. Now think about this. You cannot free yourself from sin. Just like that slave of back then could not free himself from his master. You cannot free yourself from sin. Why? Because you can't free yourself from your guilt. You are guilty of sin. You can deny it. You can try to forget it. But it will not go away. can't free yourself from sin's power no matter how hard you try you just can't get loose from its grip and there's another bit of bad news by the way sin ruins your relationship with God God is holy God hates sin we in America and I guess all human beings we like to categorize sin we like to say this sin is worse than this sin. It's always somebody else's sin is worse than my sin. We like to say, well, that, that's a worse sin right there. In God's eyes, there is no worse sin. They're all worse sins, if that makes sense. He didn't say, oh, this sin isn't quite as bad as that sin. If you lie or if you murder someone, God looks at it the same. You're a sinner. That's it, period. Now, we, in, in, in our culture, we go, well, no, you don't send a man to the electric chair for lying, but you might send a man to the electric chair for murder. God says this, you go to hell whether you lie or murder. In God's eyes, it's the same. God hates sin. And as long as you're a slave to sin, your relationship with God is ruined. But the good news is this. It's the baby born in Bethlehem. That baby can redeem you from sin. Remember I said one of the ways that a, save, a slave was freed back then was somebody would go and pay the price of what it took to buy that slave, to redeem that slave, to set that slave free. That's what Jesus did for us. He was born under the law. What that means is he is subject to God's demand for perfect obedience. We are bor born under the law. And being born under the law means that we are supposed to keep every one of the Ten Commandments perfectly. That we're supposed to keep every law in this book perfectly. None of us have done that. We're born under the law. We are sinners. We've broken a law somewhere down the line. Even if it was just one, you broke it. And it's a condemnation to a place called hell. But Jesus was born under the law. He was subject to the same demands for perfect obedience that all mankind is subject to. But the big difference is he kept God's laws perfectly because he was not a slave to sin. And because he was free, he could pay the price for your freedom. A slave could not buy, back, buy the freedom of another slave. You cannot buy the, the freedom of someone from their sins because you yourself are a sinner. We had to have somebody who was not a sinner, and that was Jesus. And because he was free, he could pay the price for your freedom, which was his death on the cross. How much devil do you want for Harlan's soul? Jesus, I want your life. I'm so glad Jesus said I was worth it. And you were worth it. And he went to the cross to buy your freedom. To redeem you. Every Christmas I try to remind us of this. 
Jesus was born to die. He came with a purpose, and that purpose was a cross. He was born to die, to redeem you from sin, to offer you a not guilty verdict before a holy God, and to set you free from guilt, to set you free from defeat, to set you free from eternal damnation. Jesus puts it this way. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you really will be what? Free. But Jesus was not born just to set you free from slavery, from slavery to sin. Jesus was also born to change our relationship with God. Now think about this. That's the second word that Paul uses to explain the change that Jesus brings uh, to our lives. He uses, the, the second word is adoption. Adoption. And what this tells me is that God frees us from slavery to sin in order to, now get this, He frees us from slavery to sin in order to make us His children, to make us His sons and His daughters. He sent Jesus not just to take our, our chains off, but to adopt us into His family. Bruce Barton writes this. He said, in Roman culture, a wealthy man could take a slave and make that slave his child and heir. The adopted person was no longer a slave. He became a full heir, guaranteed all legal rights to the father's property. He was not a second-class son either. He was equal to all other sons in his father's family. That person's origin or past was no longer a factor in his legal standing. Folks, Jesus wasn't born just to set you free, but to set you a place at God's table. To welcome you home to a new family. To make you a beloved child of God. So again, how would you describe your relationship with God right now? Jesus was born to change your relationship with God. Jesus came to this earth to do this for you in your relationship with your Heavenly Father before you had no relationship. But if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you now have a relationship. And you know, folks, it's one thing to know this in your mind, but it's another thing to make sure of it in your heart. And that's why Paul adds one more area where the birth of Jesus can make a difference in your life. And that's this. It can change your experience with God. The birth of Jesus can change your experience with God. Joan of Arc was a deeply religious French peasant girl who who victoriously led the armies of France against uh, the armies of England during the Hundred Year War. And she claimed that she was guided by the voice of God. And when she was captured by the English, one of the soldiers mocked her by saying this. She says she hears God's voice. Why don't I hear his voice? It is said that Joan replied to him, But don't you wish you did? Right? Now, I don't know about you, but I want to connect personally with God. I want to connect personally with Him. I want to experience God in a real way, not just in my mind. I just don't want to know about Him. I want to know Him. I want to know Him in my heart. That, Paul says, is one of the reasons that Jesus was born into this world. He gives you the assurance in your heart that you are a child of God. You don't have to just know about Him. You can experience Him and know Him. Christ came to enable us to experience God, to experience God's love, security, that love and security that is known between a father and a child. And Paul warns us then there in verse 7. What's he say here? He says, So you are no longer a slave, but a son. 
And if a son, then an heir through God. What Paul is doing here, he's warning in verse 7, don't keep living like a slave. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, quit living like a slave. Start living as who you really are. You are a child of God. You're a son or a daughter of God. You are no longer a slave. One of the things back in the Roman culture, someone could have their freedom purchased. A slave could have their freedom purchased. That slave also had a choice. That slave had two choices, to accept the freedom that was purchased or to say, I reject the freedom that was purchased. I desire to remain a slave under this master. And if that slave chose that, they would take an owl and make a humongous hole in that slave's ear to designate that he forever and ever would be a slave. He refused the freedom and chose to remain a slave. Paul says, get that picture in mind, he says, don't live like a slave anymore. Accept the freedom. Grab hold of the freedom that you have been given through Christ. Live like the child of God you are. Because if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, that's who you are. Yes, Jesus came to this earth to make that kind of relationship with God possible. A relationship that was not possible before is now possible through Him. That's the change, the birth of Jesus has it comes he came to make that's a change he came to make i'll get this right i'm too excited about this he came to make that change in your heart but so many times we don't live it it's like we're still slave don't choose that anymore jesus came to bring a change from the experience of being a slave a slave to sin, to being a child of God's. Don't let Satan mess with you, folks. Satan will make you think, oh, you're not worthy. Look at your past. Look at your past. Yes, we have a past of sin. All of us do. But here's the great thing. That past of sin, because of Jesus Christ, when we accept Him as our Lord and Savior, is forgiven. We've been redeemed from it. It is held against us no more. God has marked pardoned all over that thing. You are, when God looks at you, He doesn't see you in your sins. He sees His Son in the blood of His Son that covers you. You have been freed. And you have been made a child of His. And one day, and each day is one day sooner, one day we're going to be living in the house of God. And when he looks at you, he's not going to say, well, Mel, how's it going? He's going to be saying, hey, my son, how's it going? Hey, my daughter, how's it going? Think about this. We are equal heirs to the son. Think about that. Now blow your mind. What the son owns, we have also will have heirship to. That's just phenomenal. But that's how much God loves you. And that's what the change that Jesus does, what Jesus brought into this world, the change of Christmas. I don't know how many of y'all have ever read the short story, The Luck of Roaring Camp. I had to read it back in high school. That's, yeah, they had a few stone tablets still left back then. And that. But... Uh, it's a great little story, I think written in the late 1800s, if I remember correctly, somewhere in there. Uh, and I had, to, I had to look it up because I remember just very little about it, but I remembered some stuff on it that goes so well and illustrates today's message. Roaring Camp, according to the story, was the meanest, toughest mining camp in the West. It was inhabited entirely by men, except for one woman who was named Cherokee Sal. One day, Cherokee Sal dies as she gives birth to a baby boy. 
And the men take this baby, this newborn baby, and they put him in a box with some old rags around him. Well, they decide that doesn't look exactly right, and so they send one man 80 miles to buy a rosewood cradle for this baby. And he brings it back, and they put the rags and the baby in this rosewood cradle, but it still, it still doesn't look right. So they send another man to Sacramento who comes back with a beautiful, beautiful lace and silky blankets. And, and now it looks fine until somebody, I say, look, and they look at the cradle and the beautiful blankets and the baby laying in it. And they happen to look outside the cradle and they see the dirty floor. It's filthy. So these hardened, tough mining men get down on their hands and knees and they scrub the floor clean till it shines. And they look up and they see that that clean floor now makes the walls and ceiling and the dirty windows look absolutely terrible. So they wash the walls and the ceiling and they put curtains on the windows. And after they finally uh, get things looking better, their behavior also starts to change. They give up a lot of their fighting because, I don't know if you know this or not, but babies don't sleep much during a brawl. And they watch their words when, when he starts, because when he starts learning to speak, they don't want to teach him any bad language. The whole temperature of Roaring Camp seemed to go down. They'd take the baby out and they'd set him by the entrance of the mine in that rosewood cradle so they could see him when they came up out of the mines. And then someone noticed that, man, this is a dirty place. And so they plant flowers and a nice garden right there at the entrance of the mine, and it looks beautiful. And now they would bring him shiny stones and things they'd find in the mine, and they'd go and they'd hand it to them, and as they put their hands next to his hands, they realized how dirty their hands actually were. Pretty soon, as the story goes, the general store was all sold out of soap and shaving gear. What changed Roaring Camp? A baby. A baby boy. That baby changed everything. So the question then is, is can the birth of another baby boy named Jesus change everything for you? You'll never know the answer to that question unless you come to him and ask him to change your history to change your relationship with God, and to change your experience with God. That's his invitation for you this morning if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never accepted him, to come to him and to believe and see for yourself how Christmas, how his birth changes everything. Let me ask you to bow your heads in prayer you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is your invitation, as I said, for you to know a real change in your life. I mean, when you look at your life, you've got to admit, you've been messing it up. Jesus says, I want to change that. I want to change that. And you can know that change by praying a prayer something like this. Now, there's no magic in, this word, in these words, so if you don't get it all, that's okay. It's whether or not you really mean it. Lord Jesus, today, I'm asking you to change my life. Today, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. Today, Jesus, I pray that you will change my history change my relationship with God and change my experience with God. Today, I desire to become a child of God and I want to follow you the rest of my life. And Jesus, I'm trusting in you for my eternity. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I promise you, according to what God says right here, who does not lie, you're changed. You're changed. You, you're saved. And we'd invite you during this invitation time to just step out into the aisle and come down and say, man, preacher, I, I prayed that prayer. Why? We want to celebrate with you. We want to celebrate the change. 
But also this, Scripture also says that if you will not acknowledge God before man, that, that Jesus will be ashamed of you before the Father. There is no such thing as a secret Christian. You either live for him or you don't. So today, let that stand. Let you come and forward be that statement of, yes, I'm living for Jesus. We invite you to come. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer, but you sure haven't been living the life of one. It's like you're going back to the old master again. You're being enslaved to sin again. Remember who you are. You're a child of God. Start living that way. Maybe you might need to come to this altar and just recommit your life to the Father. Just recommit your life to Him uh, and, and get things back right again. You may be here today and, and God's put on your heart that this is a place uh, uh, that you need, he would have you come and join and, and be a part of this church as we do the best we can to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to celebrate the change that Christmas brings. Whatever God has laid on your heart today, would you do it for him? Do it for him, for his glory, and know the change he wants to bring in your life. Father God, thank you, Lord, for these words from Paul. Father, thank you for the change that Christmas brings. Lord, if there's anyone here today, Father, that does not know Jesus as their Savior, may they desire that change that only He can bring. May they say yes to Him. And Father, we'll give you all the glory. And Father, for other decisions on our hearts, whether as believers we're not living the way we should, Father, may we re recommit ourselves to you for that change of getting things back right again with you. Lord, whatever you, you've asked us to do, Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray, just speak to us. And may we say yes for your glory. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. From the media team at First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas, we want to say thank you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or want to know how you can experience the love of Christ in your life and family, visit us online at fbctroytx.org and send us a message. Thank you and have a wonderful week.